Do what the Welch pull the law. Lady Lilith, first mother, mother of night, you who stood for what you thought was right, you who uttered the words of magic before the races of man, may I be as strong as you, may you be my aspiration and my root, may I dance with you in the eternal pleasures of night. May I have health and wealth and strength and joy and peace in that feminine will and love and will that's perpetual happiness. This is a prayer to Lilith, which I wrote. It undergoes minor revisions periodically as my recitation changes. This was last revised on the 14th of July, 2020. It breaks down as follows. Lady Lilith, First Mother. Lilith was the first wife of Adam. After fleeing him, she begat children via other spiritual entities and through succubus-style visits to Adam and his descendants. Mother of Night. She is the queen of succubi, incubi, vampires, and other creatures of the night. You who stood for what you thought was right. She felt no need for subservience to Adam, so she refused. This destroyed her marriage. You who uttered the words of magic for the races of man. She fled Adam by use of the Tetragrammaton, which she spoke. Later she gave her daughter Qualmana to Cain to be his wife, thus bringing us civilization. May I be as strong as you. May you be my aspiration and my root. May I dance with you in the eternal pleasures of night. This is an identification of the self with the divine, a reference to the Muladhara and Svanasthana chakras, and the reward as promised in chapter 1 of Al, as well as the rather obvious benefit of involving oneself with sex demons. May I have health and wealth and strength and joy and peace in that feminine will and lover will, that perpetual happiness, which is lifted from Liber 15, the Gnostic Mass. Then I use OM, which is using the Thelemic spelling, a Thelemic closure, which is similar in purpose to Amen, but instead references the great recurrence, birth, death, rebirth cycle. It is built off the Sanskrit OM, but spelled out so as to equal 93 in Gematria. Lilith is the mother of the night, queen of succubi, incubi, and all other denizens of the night. She is wild, passionate, and independent. When humanity feared the night, she was cast in a negative light. Now that we have grown up, or at least reached puberty, we can see that the frightening shadows gather their power from our projected fears. I give you the legend of Lilith. Lilith was once the wife of Samael, who is incorrectly known as Lucifer. This marriage did not last long, for she is a wild, passionate, and heroic soul, quite incompatible with the cold demeanor of Samael. After leaving Samael, she joined with Adam. Her time with Adam did not go well. Adam would insist and rail upon her. I am your lord and master, claimed Adam. However, Lilith would say, We are both equal, for we are both issued from the dust, and I will not be your slave. This went on, Adam claiming he was superior and Lilith stating they were equal. Eventually, Lilith became tired of Adam's self-perceived superiority and flew away. Adam decided this was too much and beseeched three angels, whose names were Sanoi, Sansanoi, and Smengalov, to fetch Lilith back to him. They caught Lilith above what is now known as the Red Sea, and a great battle took place. During the battle, they realized that Lilith's powers were too great for them to force her into obedience, and they attempted to drown her. She fought them off, but during the battle, drops of her blood fell into the sea, thus giving the Red Sea its name. When the angels returned to report their failure, Adam went to Yahweh and said, O Almighty Lord, the creature that was my wife has left me, claiming that since we both came from the dust, we were equal, and she refused to be my servant. So the Almighty in his wisdom caused a sleep to fall upon Adam, and in his slumber removed a rib. This he fashioned into a woman. As she had come from man, she was a part of man, and thus belonged to man. This is pretty much a literal retelling of the story found in Angelo S. Rappaport's Ancient Israel, Myths and Legends, three volumes in one. I changed the bias to positive and took poetic license with the naming of the Red Sea, though that is where the battle took place. Originally, this was found in Liber Atri Matris, a book I wrote back when I was set on forming my own magical order. It is amazing what one will do when one doesn't know how much one doesn't know. The following is also from Liber Atri Matris, circa 1994. It was meant to be a description for use in devotional practices, a kind of, this is what Lilith is and means to the temple. Some of it may still feel a bit dated, 
though I have done some editing to try and correct that. Lilith has undergone some serious changes. Angel, consort of the devil, consort of the first man, defier of Yahweh and Adam, seducer of men, seducer of women, queen of vampires, queen of demons, etc. In recent years, she has been recognized as the first feminist and utilized as a role model for women searching for an archetype to lead them to freedom. Her existence as a pre-Hebraic goddess was thought proven by a translation of the prologue of Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and the Underworld, and by an Assyrian or Sumerian relief depicting a talented woman with various symbols of godhood and royalty. The carving, however, is not labeled, and it turns out that Dr. Kramer may have taken some liberties when translating the poem. Synchronicity did not care. The thought that she might be a deity stuck, struck fertile soil. Books of various levels of scholarship and sympathy were penned. The possibility that she was of Sumerian Hebrew origin became plausible as more evidence showed that the Hebrews either had goddesses and other gods in the original indigenous religion, or that they adopted foreign gods and goddesses to supplant their war god Yahweh. Regardless of her origins in antiquity, today we have a name of power, and that name is Lilith. In 1988 through 1989, I happened through a string of synchronicities that continuously brought the name Lilith to the forefront of my mind. In the autumn of 1989, I went to the Beth Israel Synagogue in northwest Portland at about 2 a.m. There, on the walkway between the great double doors of the synagogue and what I assumed to be an administrative building, I performed an impromptu evocation of Lilith. The energy of mass doing this rite, which, of which I planned nothing, was phenomenal and culminated in Lilith revealing herself to me as a missing archetype, a forgotten goddess, of a type which so confounded society that she and her kin were denied, obfuscated, or restricted almost universally. Lilith was denied her status as a goddess, demoted to a mere demoness, which in Hebrew cosmology is less than human. Hecate was obfuscated by dividing her into three finite parts so as to inhibit her as a unified whole. The list continues. Nearly all goddesses who represent the warrior lover, the feminine all devourer, all begetter, Panthagi Pangenitor, the missing bobalic archetype, were dismissed as much as possible in the interest of society during the Osirian eon. We are now in a new eon. The pendulum has swung from the eon of Isis, hunter gatherer, quote, matriarchy, unquote, to the eon of Osiris, heracle structures, quote, patriarchy, unquote. Now in the eon of Horus, we need to harmonize these two extremes, the Bobolic and the Priapic, by recognizing that each is as important as the other and exalting them both as the divine source of all that is. Lilith has stated clearly that she exists for her children and that the myths of the previous eon were attempts to deprive her of her beloved children by those who live in fear of the dark. The chains that used to bind us are cracking. Lilith is a lithe Beautiful woman with pale skin, black hair, and blood-red lips. Her eyes are the black of a starless sky, a black that fills the entirety of the eye. She is the governess of the moon and the mistress of death. Her animals are the cat, the owl, the serpent, and the horse. She is wild, headstrong, and passionate. She feels little sympathy, but is nearly consumed with empathy. She doesn't pretend to care. She either shares your pain or she sends you on your way. She is a loving mother, but she is not one to coddle. If you can handle it, don't bother asking for pity or aid. She is quite likely to make things so bad that you can no longer handle it and then wait until the last minute to lend a helping hand. However, if you really do need her help, she will assist you without reservation. She desires equals, not servants. She was appalled by Yahweh's treatment of us in the Garden of Eden and worked with Zagreus to free us from our gilded cage. She loves those whom she respects. She governs all sexual activity and cares not who one sleeps with or how, so long as all consent and all feel pleasure. This is her preferred sacrament. Any joining together in love or lust are giving worship to Lilith. Let us wrap up with a few more notes in this brief introduction to Lilith. When I started to become aware of Lilith, I was also assaulted with various other goddesses and characters of a similar stripe. While skimming through Jung, because every occultist should have at least a passing familiarity with Jung, if for no other reason than to call out others when they misuse him, I came across the concept of the fourth aspect. We all know of the maiden mother crone classification, from Wicca, if nowhere else. These correspond to the virgin youth, the sexual initiate creating the next generation, and the wisdom bearer. These were tied to the spring, the summer, 
and the autumn. However, there is a goddess type that combines the beauty of the youth, the sexual initiation of the mother, and the wisdom, often transgressive, of the crone. This is the fourth aspect, the virgin whore, the mistress, and or the dark mother. In Christianity, this is represented by the scarlet woman, Babylon. This manifested in Thelema as Babylon. Elsewhere, we have various goddesses of magic, war, love, and destruction. Goddesses such as Kali, Astarte, Hecate, Morgan, etc. The fourth aspect is a synthesis of the other three. This is not to imply that the others are aspects of the fourth. Neither should any sense of superiority be attributed to this. Each aspect serves an important function in a functional society. Rather, if we made a triangle, or each side was a base for another triangle, each triangle would be an aspect, and the center of the triangle's center would be the fourth aspect. Uh, I'll throw up a picture here for you to try and get what I'm trying to describe here. Lilith, in particular, is a dark mother. She has sex with men to give birth to demons. It should be noted that demon is a classification of being, not a denotation of evil. She is powerful, seductive, and feminine. This is also outside the standard societal norms and thus represents a tantric and iconoclastic current. A male equivalent would be Dionysus or Odin Loki. Like Babylon, all acts of pleasure are her sacred rites. In the Thelemic canon, Crowley makes repeated references to his beloved Layla, Knight, who was his lover and Scarlet Woman. The imagery is strongly aligned to Lilith. Further, in the vision and the voice, in the third ether, which corresponds to Bina, the great mother and initiate, Lilith is directly referenced. Readings of Zone should bear in mind the traditional equation of Lilith with night terrors, the Luciferian satanic inversion of the symbolism of revelations, the alchemical transformation of poison to sustenance, and the traditional unfolding of revelation and understanding transforming that which is feared. The whole vision is filled with tantric and Luciferian symbolism. Its study is recommended. And I'd like to close this with one of my favorite quotes from Ether Zone. And Satan is worshipped by men under the name of Jesus. And Lucifer is worshipped by men under the name of Brahma. And Leviathan is worshipped by men under the name of Allah. And Belial is worshipped by men under the name of Buddha. Truth is found in the rubble of falsehood. Love is the law. Love under will.